2014 marks the 30th anniversary of the Union Carbide gas leak in Bhopal and the devastation it unleashed. In this session, celebrated photographer Pablo Bartolomeo reminds us of that night of horror. May I request Rahul Pandeta to introduce Pablo. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your tea break. Uh, I'm going to start this uh, session with a, with a cliché. And uh, as a writer-journalist, I admit to hate it that this cliché is really true. And the cliché is that the picture often tells you much more than a thousand words or two thousand words would ever tell you. That is because when you're witnessing an event as a reporter, no matter how hard you try, you're trying to capture a moment which is already fleeting. And no matter how good you are as a writer, as a journalist, there are certain aspects of that moment which will give you a miss. But the thing with the photograph is that it freezes that moment for you exactly the way it happened. And even after you see that photograph, say decades later, it will evoke within you the same kind of sentiment of joy, of nostalgia, or horror in certain cases. About 30 years ago, a young photographer uh, who was 28 years old at that point of time, landed at a place called Bhopal in the aftermath of one of the world's biggest disasters, man-made disasters, uh, the leakage of gas from the Union Carbide factory, which led to the death um, in the next many, many years of thousands of people. There are many uh, epic pictures, photographs shot during that time, but there's one photo uh, which I keep at par with other historical uh, pictures. Um, you know, there's this one picture of this young uh, Vietnamese girl uh, running on a road trying to escape uh, from a Nepal bomb, uh, which the US forces had dropped uh, in, a, in a village in Vietnam or this uh, African young boy on the verge of uh, starvation with a vulture standing next to him. That photographer, that young photographer, that 28-year-old photographer, ladies and gentlemen, is with us today. Uh, please welcome Pablo Bartolomeu. <laughs> you know, some of us who uh, report from conflict areas or jump the first thing when a disaster strikes. We get asked this question many times, why do you do this? And I think a short answer to that is, uh, we're not, uh, we not sane people <laughs> um, in, in, in many ways. There is some madness which lurks inside us. So I'm gonna introduce to you um, older, much older Pablo, uh, and hopefully saner uh, Pablo, who will talk for the first time about his experiences um, in Bhopal a few days after the disaster. Thank you. Good evening, Chennai. I'm really happy to be here because it's uh, a good sign that photography and photographers are getting a platform at a literature festival. Uh, I've been trying for a while. This came as a shot out of the dark and I have to thank Rachna Singh Davda for insisting. I was very reluctant to do this because it's a sort of personal journey. It's also mired in many controversies and uh, they're best left under the carpet. But today I thought, well, I was 28 then, I'm 58 now, it's been 30 years, let's unplug a few stories and share them with you people. So here we go. Um, I start with, of course, me. This is me as a young boy photographing. I started photographing very early. And 
I come from a family that has very mixed origins between Pakistan, Bangladesh, Burma, of course, India, and uh, I'm a Punjabi, Bengali, and Burmese cocktail. Uh, so that's how my family links up, and I have relatives, I believe, in Pakistan, which I haven't been to ever or visited. I've just found them, or they found me in Burma, and I went to visit. I've had contact with people from Bangladesh. So, you know, slowly I will be working on a project. Um, this is, as I was growing up, my father, who I ever so am so grateful for introducing me to photography. Um, and today uh, is his... Um, I think it's his 11th, no, mm, I forget, but 1985 he died, uh, 11 January, so uh, for me it's an emotional and an auspicious day. Originally my talk was two days later, but as it so happens it's today, so it's a great day to share this with you people. This is what I morphed into as a young photographer, and this is the time that I started to uh, do my early black and white work, where I was photographing more intimate narratives, my friends, my family, other things that were happening around during the hippie era. This is at St. Stephen's College um, at the Rock Fest in 1974 or here are friends of mine, you know, pretty much what young people do now, I guess, it hasn't changed, it's just that it was then. Many of these are parents, and the kids have a hard time trying to reconcile that their parents were so hip then. Um, I went off to Bombay, leaving Delhi and an unfinished school uh, to work as a stills photographer, and there I photographed uh, uh, in the film industry and of course on the side I did my own projects like this picture with Amitabh which the, with aging extras or in Calcutta on the street or when I went to photograph Satyajit Ray uh, on the film set of Shatranj Ke Khilari or one of his actors, um, the well-known Shundo Chatterjee, Dhritaman Chatterjee, and uh, his son, Pablo Jr. All my parents at not a very happy moment when I was morphed into that long-haired brat. Um, 1983 is when I jumped into news after having worked in the movies, in advertising, corporate work, it didn't somehow sit well, and I always wanted to be able to work professionally in the media, and I joined the photo agency, French-American photo agency called Gamma Liaison, and then that brought me into sort of documenting the history of India between the years 19... 83 and about 2003, 20-odd years. So now, to give you a context of Bhopal, of course, you know, the 80s was a time of great ferment. Khalistan movement started. Uh, Sant Brindanwal, who you see here, uh, spearheaded it out of the Golden Temple. Then you had Operation Blue Star, and this is from actually Black Thunder 2 which was much later in 1988, um, basically f led by KPS Gill. But um, before that, the unfortunate Blue Star was a big bungle by sending the army into uh, the Golden Temple. And for that, Mrs. Gandhi paid for her life when the Sikh, her Sikh guards turned on her 31st October 1984 and killed her. So um, then, of course, came the rise of Rajiv Gandhi. Rajiv Gandhi became like an interim 
Prime Minister. But before that, the other horror unfolded, and that was that um, as Mrs. Gandhi's funeral finished, mobs tore into Sikh homes, property, destroying their lives um, and creating great destruction and horror. Um, of course, that's another uh, chapter of history which hasn't gone full circle, and there are many uh, questions there. Of course, then, this is where the story of Bhopal starts. First December, 1984, the elections are going to start. Dilip Mehta, who's a photographer with Contact Press, which is an American photo agency, calls me up saying I'm in Delhi. He's Canada-based and then come, would come often to India. He's also the brother of the well-known filmmaker Deepa Mehta. So Dilip says, hey, listen, the elections are starting. Why don't we gang up? We can split expenses and go off to, you know, start seeing what's, how the election is unfolding. So 2nd of December, we find ourselves in Patna, and we are looking around to see signs of what's happening. We see at a traffic point these cut cutouts are being put up of Mrs. Gandhi, Rajiv Gandhi. Um, you know, the machinery is just kicking in to start the election campaign. Uh, that afternoon on the radio, um, it, this is of the third. We arrive on the second, this is the third morning we take these pictures, and in the afternoon, I hear on the radio, on the BBC, saying 30 dead in a gas explosion in Bhopal. So I turn to Dilip and say, hey, the radio is saying there's 30 dead. Do um, you think this is something we should look at? Because a few months ago, there was a very big story in Mexico where there was in an industrial factory a huge explosion that left many people dead and uh, we should keep a watch on it. Dilip says, ah, oh, 30, you know, this is India. So, okay, you know, we have other things to do. We've set our agenda that evening. We fly out to Lucknow, and we're going to Amethi to uh, look at Menika, who is uh, Rajiv's sister-in-law, uh, Menika Gandhi kick off her campaign from the Pilibit area, so she's in the Sultanpur, Raibareli, Amethi belt. Um, at night, we land up at a dhaba uh, just outside Sultanpur railway station, and there's a black and white TV there. Doordarshan news is, has just started. And I look at this TV and I see pretty much like this intersection, but in black and white, there are these hand carts being pulled or pushed, piled with bodies, and my jaw kind of opens, um, and I'm nudging Dilip saying, look, look, hey, this is Bhopal. And it's very fuzzy footage, terribly shot, but it was the most surreal looking at that time as we sort of both gape at the television, and it's a short clip and it goes. Not much is said, not much is explained, but that sort of becomes like a wake-up call that maybe something bigger is happening and we should go. So we eat dinner and jump into the car and start heading out towards Lucknow. Of course, good North Indian winter. The fog is so heavy that we can't see five feet and the driver says, look, I can't find the road. We may have an accident. So we decide, okay, let's stay the night, work with Menika tomorrow, cover whatever she's doing, leave early afternoon so we can catch the evening flight to Delhi. Okay, so we work with Menika, photograph her, giving her speeches, meeting people, all that sort of stuff. Take the uh, car back. 
We arrive at Lucknow Airport. The Indian Airlines plane has a tire, burst tire. It's going nowhere. Anyway, there are no seats on that plane, so even when the replacement tire does come and it takes off, it may not take us. So we go to the railway station, find a train. We get a train around 11 o'clock at night that takes us to Agra. Uh, we reach there at 4 in the morning. We wake up a cab driver, drive to Gwalior, and from Gwalior, we take the hopping flight which comes to uh, Delhi, Gwalior, Bhopal, Indore, Bombay. Those wonderful hopping flights that just about don't exist anymore. And we are very grateful that we didn't go back to Delhi because apparently the journalists and the photographers and the TV crews were beating each other up to get onto the plane because in those days it was all manual ticketing, it wasn't computerized, so every sector had a quota and that's all there was. So there was a quota, thankfully, from Gwalior of six passengers, so we, both Dilip and me got in. And when we got into the plane, we met Raghu, that's Raghu Rai, and we looked at him and said, hmm, why are you so late? And he says, oh, I miss the waking up and miss my flight yesterday, so here I am. So here we are, three photographers, disembark at Bhopal to find there is no transport available. And we wait around for about an hour till some car or cabbie shows up and this is why the three of us jumped into the same car, went to the same locations and that's why we have near similar images pretty much and that's basically the story. But in news photography, it's not uncommon to have near similar images. There are many, many iconic images. Uh, for example, the one that symbolizes Tenement Square, the man facing a row of tanks. There are seven versions of that. Of course, one photographer gets the award, and that image becomes famous. It's pretty much like a lottery sometimes, you know. Somebody gets lucky. In this case, I got lucky, and that's how it started. So, the night of 2nd December, the morning, dawn of 3rd, there was some amount of fog, mist, and then came the gas leak, and it engulfed the slum across Union Carbide. The Hindu that morning of the third didn't have anything. In fact, most of the newspapers, Indian newspapers didn't because this happened so late and that the deadlines were over and it was, but the New York Times, which is let's say anything from nine and a half to 12 hours after had a mention saying, gas leak in India kills at least 410 in the city of Bhopal. By that time, the campaigning had started. Rajiv Gandhi was already walking through UP, through their constituency, um, and then, of course, he wins later on and becomes prime minister. Next day, 4th, December, the Hindu headlines, 350 killed as poisonous gas leaks from a Bhopal plant. The story is getting bigger every day. And we, by the time we turn ourselves around, we are in the three photographers arrive in Bhopal fifth morning. So that's third morning, fourth morning, fifth morning, third running day. And this is what Bhopal, one view of it, a scenic view, which is the big lake and you have the a big mosque, which you see the minarets. And on the hill is Hamidia Hospital, which also is the medical university. And this is where, thank God that this institution was there, because this is where everybody got taken and at least there was some kind of treatment 
Um, otherwise, it could have been even a bigger disaster. That's J.P. Nagar, Jayaprakash Nagar, looking out at the Union Carbide factory. That's the entrance security at the Union Carbide. Union Carbide. Then, uh, I think this is 5th December, uh, Bhopal gas leak toll rises to over 1,000. And that's, that morning is when we first go to the hospital, but I'll start with um, just across the people affected. So what this gas did, for a long time it wasn't identified. It's still not identified whether nobody's really confirmed that it's MIC, um, which is methyl isos... All right, good. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, Union Carbide never really released what it could have been, thereby um, the detox for it couldn't be found fast enough and people suffered and basically it burns soft tissue. So your eyes and lungs, your, the, 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 the porous sacs of your lungs start to collapse and become like jelly, which, and then just, you know, over years you have these respiratory problems. Um, and it just, you know, created absolute chaos and mayhem. People couldn't see. They had breathing problems. Um, so, as you can see, these are people affected. It wasn't just human beings. Lots of livestock died. And then they had these sort of graveyards quite far about 20 kilometers from Bhopal, where they would just lay all these dead animals. Street views of J.P. Nagar and surrounding. I mean, there was panic. People started to leave, uh, you know, and though sometimes people were affected and left and then went and died somewhere else. So the actual count is really a question mark. Or the gas traveled in a passage in a certain corridor, and those were more affected than others. Bhopal is hills, small hills, and small lakes. So this was only to one side, and the bureaucracy, the politicians, the rich folk lived on the other side, ironically, as always, and they didn't get quite affected. Though, I must confess, my immediate neighbor who lives below me um, her husband is a sort of a kind of politician and they were in Bhopal at that time. He's from uh, Madhya Pradesh and she was pregnant. So, you know, she tells me that her younger daughter is slow, which she is, and that's one of the reasons. So there's that, you know, immediate connection in my uh, building. These are people coming into uh, uh, Hamidia Hospital. Again, you can see that this man has this respiratory breathing problem. And across the board, the eyes, you know, it's just burning of the eyes. Then you can't look at bright light. I think the worst was the children, the little children, you know, because they're, they're anyway so vulnerable. And then at that age to be able to, you know, cope with uh, uh, your support system, trying to fight, whatever. And it was really very tragic. And that's why I think the symbol of the Bhopal gas tragedy, well chosen um, by the World Press photo, is the symbol of a child that we all photographed. <coughs> the
The thing is that most of the care here was very basic because nobody knew what to give as an antidote to help heal or stop uh, whatever was happening to the body or rebuild the damage. And then there were these makeshift uh, camps that were constructed because people felt too frightened or traumatized of living in their home and that added another layer of problems because there was, it was December, January, it was cold, um, not enough shelter. And then, on, this is 6th of December, the gas leak toll um, rising. And then, of course, you know, as the children and people started to die, you had to be able to do something about, um, you know, cremating them, burying them. So there were these mass cremations because often uh, people were not identified and beyond a point the morgue was completely full. There was uh, no space um, and to sort of keep health and sanitation, they had to be disposed and there was this very crude way where there was a plaster put on the head with a number or if you people were lucky, they had their next of kin like this old man carrying a young child. So our beat started to become the hospital, the cremation slash burial ground because they were next to each other and then J.P. Nagar and the Union Carbide factory and the area around it. Of course in between Rajiv Gandhi paid a visit then you had as you will see from the newspaper headlines, um, Warren Anderson, the chairman, came. He was mock arrested. Um, so, mass funeral pyres. And then young Hindu children being buried, Muslim children being buried. I'm showing a lot of the same images and part of it is I just want people to sh see how when we shoot we sort of move around, photograph, sometimes take multiple pictures of the same thing. So you have a sense of, you know, how, and this is getting to closer to the moment when we all photographed uh, the boy that then gets this award, not me, the boy. Um, so this is really that pit, the grave, where, and I was on a wide shot first, and the sort of last caress of, uh, I don't know whether it's the father or what family member it is, but I did try and put out a call to trace this family f over several years, but unfortunately, I've had no luck. And finally, this is the image that then gets awarded. And by then, there are so many unidentified deaths that you have these charts all over the city with numbers for people to come and ID and possibly contact the authorities, um, you know, f to further do paperwork or whatever. And then, you know, as I said earlier, people start to flee because they feel unsafe or 
um, uh, traumatized and the trains start filling up. In fact, one of the other untold stories is uh, because the way the Union Carbide Factory, JP Nagar, it's quite close in one direction to the station and the porters on duty that night were very badly affected because the, 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 the gas corridor kind of went by the station. And there could have been, there are stories that there could have been uh, a terrible accident, uh, but um, a signalman uh, stopped a train in time far outside and didn't let it come uh, into the station. But the coolies were very badly affected. And for a few days, there was this kind of chaos where people were piling up you know, into trains, buses, whatever mode they could get, put stuff on handcarts and leave. That's 7th October. The official toll now is 2000. Of course, the pictures of MGR, I think. And then, of course, you had people like Mother Teresa who came to offer help. So we were there, kind of, at least I was there uh, for a few weeks. Yes, we would go back to Delhi ever so often because by that time the story had become so big that all the three major networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, had chartered a little Avro propeller plane and they would come in the morning, photograph, uh, and then go uh, back in the evening to beam up the edit and beam up the story. It, the story had really become very big. Um, so there were times that we would just then send our films with them because those days it was still film, not like the digital era now. We had to physically send our film. Uh, people would pick it up, an agent or a magazine office, and then send it out on a uh, airline uh, to Paris or New York, depending on who we were working with. So there's Arjun Singh, who was then the chief minister. Um, and then that's the Imam, uh, the ex or the deceased Imam of Jama Masjid. He also landed up. Um, and then this is 8th of December. So on the 7th, uh, Warren Anderson, who came to visit because the disaster was so big and he wanted to see, was then arrested. It was a bit of a ma it was a sham, a kind of mock arrest where. He arrived in Bhopal, he was kind of taken into protective custody and then let out through the back door while we were all waiting in front of the guest house uh, premises uh, of the Union Carbide. And because it became so big, the whole uh, story that you had people like Melvin Belli, this huge giant of a man, um, and also one of the biggest ambulance chaser lawyers, which um, you know make millions of if you get an injury uh, or you want to sue somebody for all sorts of things. Not just Melvin Belli, but there were at least five, six American lawyers that came in, and they started to get people to sign so that they could sue Union Carbide, you know, and make millions for these people, maybe, but for themselves, for sure. Unfortunately, it didn't go that route um, because uh, the government of India did, again, a deal. Um, I wish they had been like they are today with the diplomat in New York. Maybe if they were as, you know, uh, volatile and gung-ho, we may have seen a different 
uh, scenario for the victims of Bhopal. And this is uh, when I went on a visit with Melvin Belai to uh, gas victims' home, and you can kind of see the kind of ill at ease. This is how Frontline ran the picture. I don't know how it came from the photo agency. Frontline had a relationship with my agency, Gamma, and they would get images and they ran it. It was sort of flipped. So, but this image has been run in different orientations, but whatever the orientation is, it's also been run horizontal, uh, vertically. In fact, I won the award uh, in a vertical version of it, but it doesn't take away from the image. Um, I went back one year after um, and I did so at great personal kind of uh, family uh, drama. My brother was getting married, my younger brother, and I had to choose, am I going to go to Bhopal or am I going to attend his wedding? I chose that I go to Bhopal and many people were not very happy. Well, now that we look back, his first marriage unraveled, so I feel a little better. <laughs> so one year after, there's a lot of graffiti in the gates, the walls, the compound walls. It's in a certain way business as usual, women out there collecting water. Things look kind of normal in a certain way, but that's very deceptive because what is inside you, you're half or one third or a quarter of who you were in terms of energy, maybe your eyes. So it's, it's just very, very deceptive, you know, things look, but, and then you have these kind of children that get, start getting born uh, deformed um, and, of course, you know, with the compensation, uh, the greed of all the middlemen involved, I couldn't say that I had a great um, high uh, sort of um, word for the medical community because there's so many quacks that made lacks and lacks trying to dispense some kind of treatment. It was just a sham. These are all the breath tests, looking at the eyes, because those are the things that were most affected, the two. The f first year, they did start some kind of rehabilitation work for women. They were making gloves, knitting, all that sort of stuff. But by year three, all that wound up. I don't know why, but it did. And you had people, you know, just suffering in their misery, and of course, the eve of the gas tragedy is always when all these marches take place and then they burn the effigies. And different, there were of course the politics even there, there were different groups of activists and then there would be two or three different events and activities that would take place. Um, I went back on the ninth anniversary and again, looking at the people, things were not so great. Some amount of compensation had come in and again, you know, different forms of agitation, protest.
This was a Dutch woman artist who made a memorial right across from the Union Carbide. Um, her name, first name I remember, Ruth. I don't remember the second part. And then 10 years later, again, those same charts have now been framed and are being used of the missing or unidentified people, more different sorts of graffiti protests. Many of the agitating leaders were kind of bought out. I mean, for example, there was one group whose leader was given, uh, uh, you know, some contract for boat rides on one of the lakes. So one kept on hearing these sort of stories. This was a very uh, moving couple, this Muslim man. Uh, and his wife, and he would take her out every day in the winter into the sun. And then on this, on the 10th anniversary, they built all these memorial stones and ran into the Union Carbide factory and planted them, and each one who had a relative who had died took the stone in uh, and planted it. And it's that time when I couldn't trace the boy. I said, what is it that I can do to try and find something that I can mark the occasion and then 10 years after? And I, the three people that I photographed outside the Union Carbide factory, these three, I got them together. And mercifully, all of them were alive. Not so well, but alive. And then 20 years later, when I go back, <coughs> I, you know, you can't go back and do the same thing. So I decided, which is something I should have done before, is go and see what's going on inside the factory. And you see all this toxic stuff is lying around. Uh, everything's in decay. Um, if you look at all this red goo, or dried chemical, which there, it rains, it goes into the groundwater. Um, this is one of the control panels. The systems look so archaic. No wonder some collapse happened. And then you have children. It's supposed to be a no-go zone, but you have children playing cricket. They climb up the walls. You're not supposed to drink this water. There's a sign there. All the people around are, are get water and tankers, but, you know, uh, I'm going to need two minutes. Um, eh, but, you know, it's happening, and this is causing all sorts of medical problems, and nobody's addressing that. Here's a woman who lost a son. This woman has a speech, her vocal cords and throat got affected. This man has a skin deformity that occurred. This guy was born after and his legs are deformed. This is a girl who's actually 17 years old, but she looks like a child and just across from the slums. But it's not something that is just to people in the slums. For example, here is another example. This girl is 17 or 18, but looks like a, you know, child, so it doesn't matter whether you're in the slum or a middle-class home. And then the people that I photographed 10 years after, the three, now there are only two. The old woman, she died. 
And I think I will go back this year. It's a little sad. It's become like being a tourist. Um, but I look at it really like a failure of something that I wasn't able to do. And part of it is that so many years has gone by and I never jumped into it then. And I, somewhere I feel it's a little late, but uh, as uh, something that I've been involved with, I will try and go back this year. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Uh, all right, we have a, a time of about 10 minutes for questions. Uh, please keep them brief. Uh, go ahead, please. Yes. Yeah, just two questions. Uh, since you, uh, you and Raghura and the other photographer went to Bhopal without knowing what the uh, chemicals were or what the dangers were, what did you do to protect yourself? The second question is, uh, I ask this to every photographer who goes and photographs tragedies. How much do you feel you're invading into certain private lives? And how much do people allow you to invade into their, in, into their lives? Or do, do, you, do you feel guilty sometimes that you're trading too much into their lives? Sorry, what was your first question? Uh, the chemicals, like how did you, how did the photographers try, how, did you have any protection? Well, we didn't know what was happening. So it's part of the risk taking that uh, you work in the media. When you go into a riot or an earthquake or the tsunami or whatever, it's part of your job, you don't know, you can die. It's part, of, part and parcel of what uh, is the risk factor. Uh, you can't be a gentleman photographer and kind of do it from a distance, you have to jump in. Um, your second question, yeah, we are vultures in a certain way, but again, um, this is a profession which also informs, so it's a dual part of it. I mean, I believe that whatever I have done or some of the colleagues I've done, uh, who've uh, worked with me or the photographers that I've looked up to and have influenced me, who worked in conflict, um, war, uh, or natural disaster, have a humanist way of looking at life, and that's what they intend to do and spread the word. Um, of course, you can be exploitative, but it's not like celebrity photography uh, or paparazzi, which is at the other end of the spectrum. Thanks. My question uh, to you, both of you and all this audience is like, has like Indian uh, politicians or Indian society grown a thick skin? Like we've been uh, hearing these kind of massacres like from 47 when uh, the partition happened and millions of people were killed and people from foreign countries won awards based on those photographs which they picked up. Fine. Then uh, came 1989 when uh, half a million Kashmiri people were thrown out of their homelands. Uh, then you have 1984, sorry, before that, 1984 when six were murdered. And there was a lot of uh, publicity on that, like on media, forums or photographs or like these artists like do a wonderful job in that. But like there is not have been a, like a, any prosecution, anything where somebody takes a responsibility on that, like, okay, I have done. It's now only now that Manmohan Singh has finally apologized to sick people. But uh, these kind of things are not happening in our society. Is it like we have gone cold or have we forgotten these kind of things? What is it? Now, uh, now Muzaffar Nagar, what has happened in Muzaffar Nagar? Uh, people have been exiled and thrown out, murders and rapes are going on nowadays. So what is this going on in our society? I put this question to you. I think we're just too lazy and complacent. We're too comfortable in, in our, our own because. little cocoon. It has to do with economic structure, it has to do with uh, religious structure, it has to do with uh, what caste community you are in, and because of all of that, unfortunately, you just remain insulated, isolated, thinking that it's not your problem. Um, sir? 
there is a moment of uh, negotiation that you are working at when you are making yeah. these yeah. mm, yes sorry the, when you are making these pictures mm -hmm. like for instance you picture this child and then you change the lens you go for a wide angle the same how do you reconcile to it you have to negotiate you are working you are making a picture you are there you have to make a picture you are making another picture with another lensing but it's also a moment which you went through you have to reconcile no because uh, I, i don't know how else to frame this question well it has adverse up uh, i think uh effects maybe i'm the strange guy that i am you don't know me <laughs> but the gentleman sitting next to you maybe knows me a little better but um, you know it does manifest and it's only now that there are studies being done on photographers and journalists who've been in conflict areas and how it affects them there are many ways especially i think um uh, I was part of one of these surveys and mostly they were western photographers that had gone into Asia, Africa um and worked and when they came back to their rather nice uh lifestyle they couldn't just fit in whether it was sleep whether it was being social whether it was family some things didn't come you know didn't work and things were you know went astray but that's i think part and parcel of some of this kind of thing like i think if you look at um, if you now listen to the wonderful british uh, war photographer um um there's david douglas duncan um they all sort of have a they want to disconnect from what they've done uh somewhere because it it's too uneasy but i look at it you know there are moments of uneasiness for this for me this is a big failure i look at it as a big failure for the media for me that i couldn't contribute a change of any sort um, yes how did you feel while taking these photos uh you know you don't feel uh in a certain way when you're taking these pictures because you have to work when you're working you have to some part of you needs to be very focused and not get emotional it's the same i draw this analogy and i say it again and again and again it's like working like a surgeon when somebody is doing a heart operation you're working with blood body fluids um you know but you have to work you are there you have a sense of purpose and you have to follow through if you get emotional somebody can lose their life it's in the same way in when any kind of conflict situation dangerous you have to operate but you can't get emotional about it so you keep a distance yet you are seeing what is happening you are reacting to it and you're trying also to be humanistic and artistic and create something that will communicate to other people what were the measures taken by the government for people after the mic well that's a history which is marred in all sorts of controversy uh you just have to search the internet has a lot of information i'm not an expert unfortunately so i couldn't but i'll tell you they didn't do enough uh, yeah hi has uh, hello over here i read peter robuck once wrote that you know ordinary men are known by their f uh, success and heroes are known by their failures indian state is something that should aspire to be a hero i don't know whether it does you have to be a little louder please okay so uh, are you making a statement or no, no, you are asking, asking a me a question yeah but there's a preface to the question so does in state acknowledge this as a failure uh, in all your observations you need to speak into the mic not under I the mic i don't think so the indian state doesn't acknowledge it as a failure because it sort of did a deal and it did a deal which wasn't at least i feel didn't sit very well 
Uh, maybe if those ambulance, ambulance chasing lawyers got at Union Carbide, they would have really brought the company down with statutory damages, um, which would have been a great model. Um, and I think there are other models like that in India that still exist. Are we getting into the nuclear scenario right now? And there's a lot of negotiations going on or has closed because I'm not following it very closely as to what are the rights if something, uh, what are the liabilities of the company or the foreign government if something goes wrong? Uh, sir, uh, even before this incident happened in Bhopal, the same factory had their own blast in US. Since the permissions were cancelled, they have moved to a country where things are quite cheap and they have already killed more than 1,000. And the same company today is not uh, close. It is operating in the name under Everready Batteries. It is all taken over. The thing is, it is not stopped. Union Carbide, the name is changed, but there are still processes going on, of course, on a different plan. And as you know, as you are a photographer, you know about the Western things and Indian things. And today, even in an IFS officer, when she made a small mistake, they have sent her back to India. When Americans can do so much of a mistake, is it nowhere that they can be punished for killing so many innocent people? <laughs> Who holds responsibility as a media person is a question that I'm asking. Because news keeps coming, but if there is no solution for the previous thing, it is just a history, you know, people will die again tomorrow. So what do you think about that, sir? Okay, uh, I got the second part of your question. I didn't get the first. There were two questions or just one? Yeah, yeah, okay, got it, okay. Uh, yeah, my question is uh, slightly off Bhopal. That is, in your personal life, or probably a situation or a restriction that is common for all such photographers where you show sure that a particular scenery or a situation that just happened is worth photo sharing or photographing, keeping it for yourself or sharing, but you're not allowed to. Reason be political or be, be uh, communal or whatever, or physical even. Uh, would you like to throw some lights over that? Maybe okay. personal or even something common to the photographers. All right. Well, the first thing is that it's been known in all sorts of histories of the world that different governments do d different exploitative things. For example, the British were the biggest drug peddlers in the world. They used to grow opium in India and ship it to China to sell it there and exchange and barter. So, I mean, you know, that sort of exploitation has happened. It just depends who has more might and power and can do whatever they can get away with. Um, the Iraq war was fought of uh, oil. Where's that oil? What's happened? I mean, it's just, those are again things in politics, in governance, the things that happen, everybody believes they are right. I mean, you know, in war, both parties feel they are right. There's no way you can say one is right or the other. History will judge, I guess. That's the only way I can put it. And yes, sir, your question, again, things are sort of going out of my mind. The one that you asked about access, the, the, the problem really is that as photography is becoming more and more democratic, people are understanding and realizing that not everybody can have access to everything. So uh, it's a serious issue. I mean, it's a serious issue to the degree that in, let's say, England, you can't photograph a person without their permission. Even people now resist or challenge you if, you if they're on the street while you have your rights. But people can say, you can't photograph me. So there is, there are all these, you know, barriers coming up and they will come up even more, even more and more. Because also people realize that the power, you know, with a digital camera, um, I'll give you a little example. In China, when I was there um, uh, last year in, in August, they were telling me that they use social media very effectively. 
they found this one senior government official, they photographed him, so people are really looking at, they photographed his watches in public, his, you know, and they found through their photographs that he had 12 different kinds of watches and he had to be answerable and he was taken down. So, you know, it does play, photography does play in that culture, um, that sort of, uh, uh, for another example being that when there was a train crash, the government would not give out um, names of the people who had died, who had died. So it was difficult, one, to figure out whether it was 100 people that died in that train crash or whether it was 1,500. There was no way. Um, but one of the local leaders who went to visit was photographed smiling at that occasion. And there was a huge hue and cry in the social media and the guy had to resign. So there are those sort of things that happen. Maybe in India it doesn't happen because, I don't know, we are too insensitive, we've blocked ourselves, um, or we just don't fight, we are too complacent. Thank you very much. Sorry I couldn't answer all your questions another time. <laughs>